so. This is a secret message. Its contents are known only by me. It's in fact my hotel key, but that diminishes my point, so I'll put it away safely and securely. Now, when you have some secret information that you wish communicated to only specific parties, be it a pen test report or your Netflix credentials, how would you ensure only your intended target was able to receive the message? I hope for everyone in the room, the answer was either some cryptographic solution or sod off, I'm not sharing my Netflix. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there is a looming technology that is set to change the landscape of cryptography, quantum computers. They will force a change that's already begun. Although the NCSC, for example, predict that quantum computers won't be cryptographically relevant for another 10 years, the drive to move to cryptographic standards resistant to this new threat has already begun. In this talk, we will provide an introduction to this cutting edge field, discuss paradigms for security testing, and types of things to look for when offering remediation advice. Quantum cryptography and quantum resistant cryptography are set to play increasing roles within our industry and jobs in the next few years. So before we begin, I suppose it's prudent to introduce myself. As um, you've been told, my name is Imran. Hello. Uh, I have an MSc in theoretical physics, in particular gravity particles and fields. And during my studies, I participated in online bug bounty programs. I found a P2 in a Fortune 10 company, and largely because of this, was part of the group awarded the Bug Crowd 2017 VIP researcher accolade. Um, that was a transitionary point for myself from wanting to do cybersecurity as a hobby to something I've wanted to do full time as my job. And I was fortunate enough to be able to join Cybris in January of last year. And I've been very happily working as a security consultant in the industry ever since. Okay, introductions are out the way. So to begin, we'll talk about classical information, just a little bit of a background before we get to quantum information. And this is because Shannon's seminal 1948 paper discussing classical information theory put forward two important points that are relevant to our talk today. The first was the concept of entropy, which is a measure of information or randomness or disorder. And the second is that it is possible to communicate reliably over noisy channels, provided the rate of communication is less than the channel capacity. Now, with quantum information, we begin with the idea that quantum systems are the ultimate physical medium for storing and processing information. We're essentially dealing with the building blocks of the universe. We're as low level as we can possibly get on a physical, um, on a physical level. We can get uh, performance enhancements and performance increases um, with architecture and with new algorithms, but the building blocks themselves, the materials we're using, are the most efficient we can for the storage and processing of information. It tries, quantum information theory tries to extend Shannon's theory by replacing bits of information with generic 2D quantum systems called qubits and classical channels by their noisy quantum channel counterparts. In quantum cryptography, much like in classical cryptography, one would like to transmit or share information securely, except now we're using the fact that quantum states cannot be learned without being disturbed for quantum key distribution and other unique quantum phenomena for other aspects of cryptography. So, again, we'll start with classical computers to give us a bit of an introduction to quantum computers. We know with classical computers, information is stored in bits, ones and zeros. If storing one number takes 64 bits, then storing n numbers would take 64 times n bits. Calculations are essentially done the same way as they are by hand. As such, the class of problems that can be solved efficiently are the same as that can be solved by hand where efficiency refers to um, the idea that the evaluation time doesn't increase too quickly with the size of the input. With quantum computers, information is stored in qubits. And a qubit, like a classical bit, can be in a state of zero and one. However, it can also be in a superposition of these states, say A0 plus B1, where A and B are complex numbers. We use complex numbers as they provide benefits in the calculation and comprehension of qubit states, such as the ability to map states to positions on a sphere, as shown in the image. Whereas a bit can exist as either a zero or one, the two points, um, a qubit can exist in a continuum of states, and these are only confined by the boundary of the sphere with poles at zero and one. 
calculations are performed by mathematical operations called unitary transformations. These are done on the states of the qubits. And when combined with the principle of superposition, this creates possibilities not available for hand calculations. This translates to more efficient algorithms for factoring, searching, and simulation of quantum systems. Another benefit of superpositions is you get far more storage capacity on a qubit. In fact, exponential storage. If you could store, say, two numbers on one qubit, mapping each one to a state, you'd be able to store two not cube, um, four numbers on two qubits. Sorry, is that me? No, no, it's true. Ah. I've only just started. It can't be going to sleep already. <laughs> um, so yeah, so with two qubits, you have to store four numbers. With three qubits, eight. Um, there is actually an equation on the board, I don't know if it's big enough to make out, that you could rearrange and manipulate to tell you exactly how many qubits you'd need to store n numbers. I'll leave it as a little puzzle for the mathematically inclined, and anyone who's really interested can chase me down after, and I'll tell you exactly how much that is. So, are quantum computers better at everything? Well, they utilize quantum mechanics to solve problems much faster than is possible with a classical computer. Quantum mechanics relies on the principles of probability. In quantum mechanics, we depend on numbers called probability amplitudes, which can be positive, negative, or complex numbers. A simplification of the process is that we try and orchestrate it so some of the wrong answers have positive amplitudes, others have negative amplitudes, and when the calculation is done, they destructively interfere and cancel each other out. Thus, the wrong answer isn't observed. We also want the correct answers to constructively interfere so that we see them. This is a huge oversimplification, but is essentially how the process works. In general, problems that utilize parallelism, the ability to split a problem into several parts and solve them all simultaneously to arrive at a solution, are the problems that will benefit the most from the gains that quantum computers have to offer. Problems like prime number factorization, the most efficient route through a complicated city grid, are both great candidates, whereas you're unlikely to see uh, much of an FPS increase in your favorite video games. Apologies to any Fortnite fans. So where are we currently with quantum computers? Well, the largest gate model processor was released in March of last year by Google, no surprise, um, called Bristleco. It weighs in at 72 qubits. Whilst there are far larger quantum annealing processors, which are designed to solve very specific sets of problems, gate model processors are what we normally think of when we think of a quantum computer and are applicable to a far wider set of problems. They're considered the universal quantum computer. But that was last year, and what's happening this year? Well, in January, IBM, who've been very busy this year, um, introduced their first commercial, commercially available quantum system, the Q-System 1. It weighs in at about 20 qubits, and Mr. Morimoto, director of IBM Research in Tokyo and global VP, said IBM intends to commercialize quantum computers within three to five years, when he expects quantum computers to be able to outperform supercomputers in specific domains. So this first, first commercial computer can be seen as a sort of statement of intent. We also had a research breakthrough this year and succeeded in showing experimental evidence for a new state of matter. Topological superconductivity, as it is very catchily termed. Whilst the emergence of the state was seen in a 2D system, it is believed that the system can be scaled and expanded and used for the construction of qubits. This yields a potential for increased calculation speeds and boosted storage. Finally, with Q experience, IBM has effectively brought quantum. Com this sounds like a sales pitch for IBM. I promise you, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> has effectively brought quantum computers to your home with the cloud quantum computing platform. This allows for experiments to be run on Q systems and simulators. That is quantum systems and simulators, and it's available to the public. You can go sign up for the public beta right now. The cloud promises to facilitate great strides in quantum-related fields by allowing more people access to the technology. Cool, so we've got an introduction on the uh, quantum computer side of things. Let's look at the cryptography side. And I appreciate there are probably people in this room who know far more about classical cryptography than I do. So this might be teaching grandma how to suck eggs, but bear with me. So we're all on the same page with cryptography before we move on to quantum cryptography. So what is the goal of classical cryptography? Well, we want to allow secure communications over public channels. There are a bunch of ways to do this. Uh, one of them is the one-time PAL algorithm, where two parties, 
A and B, or Alice and Bob, use a one-time pre-shared key to encrypt information. An issue with this approach is that of secure key distribution, which has historically made it impractical for most applications. So how do we get past this secure key distribution issue? Well, we have things like the public-private key pair, which relies on the fact that certain mathematical tools are computationally hard. For instance, the factorization of large numbers into prime factors, as used in the RSA algorithm. The RSA algorithm um, has proved to be rather useful um, as current computers can only factor numbers as large as 250 decimal digits. I think so far, the biggest has been about 232 decimal digits. As computers become more powerful, larger prime factors will need to be used in order to preserve the security of the algorithm, but that isn't seen as a huge issue. That is until quantum computers, which threw a monkey wrench into the whole operation. Uh, in 1994, Peter Shaw showed that a quantum computer could factor large numbers into their prime factors in polynomial time. Now, a polynomial time algorithm is said to be fast. Um, it's things like addition, subtraction, square roots and logarithms on a classical computer. And as you can imagine, this will compromise the security of the RSA algorithm and others that use similar techniques if a quantum computer could calculate prime factors as quick as a classical computer could do logs. So now that we know a little bit about classical cryptography, let's move on to quantum cryptography. Now quantum cryptography derives its strengths from a few weird properties of quantum mechanics. To begin with, we have the no cloning theorem. And this states that it's impossible to create an identical copy of an arbitrary, unknown, and I must stress unknown, quantum state. As such, intercept and replay attacks are inherently protected against, as we will see later. With quantum superposition, we have two or more quantum states which can be summed to create another valid quantum state. That is, every quantum state can be thought of as a sum of two or more distinct states. As we've seen already with quantum computers, this principle is critical to how they work and contributes to many of the benefits such systems offer. <laughs> Finally, and perhaps the most famous of the quantum phenomena listed, is quantum entanglement, which is the interaction of quantum states resulting in a quantum system that is no longer independent. So you have um, two systems that interact and they can no longer be um, described independently of one another. To describe one system or one part of the system, you have to describe the other. And to affect one part, you must affect the other. Um, it has massive implications for secure communications and the teleportation of information, with active research taking place in the field. Now, I came across very recently a great analogy for entanglement. It, like most analogies, totally breaks down if you actually look at it, so please don't focus on it too much, but it gives you the general idea of how it works. So imagine I had two balls in front of me, a red ball and a blue ball. I put them both in a box, a separate box, one for the red ball, one for the blue ball, and I hide them underneath this desk. I then pick someone who's particularly quick in the audience. You look pretty quick, I'll give it to you. You can have this box. It has one of the balls in it, you don't know which one. I then ask you to run as fast as you can out of here. In fact, run so fast that you're running at the speed of light. And just keep running at the speed of light for like 30 years, we'll all wait here, it's fine. Leave the planet, just keep going in a straight line. 30 years later, I'll take the other box out. We don't know what color ball's in here. And so we can say it's either red or blue, or quantumly we can also say, it could be in a superposition of red and blue. It's, it, in fact, exists over both states simultaneously. Then I reveal the, um, the ball to you. I open the box and we see we've got the red ball. We instantly know that 30 light years away, there's a very exhausted young man in the third row who has a blue ball. Now, we haven't violated any of the laws of physics to do this, but in describing one part of the system, we've also described the other part of the system. The two were, were linked on some fundamental level. And by forcing our ball to be red, we've also forced his ball to be blue. And so, in a nutshell, and if you don't look too closely, that's entanglement. So, the pros and cons of quantum cryptography. Well, a pro is that it cannot be unknowingly intercepted. We'll see this in more detail later, but due to the properties of the no cloning theorem and quantum entanglement, it is impossible for information to be unknowingly intercepted. It's also secure irrespective of computing power. The security comes from the underlying physical properties of these devices. It's baked into the universe and it can't just be cracked with um, more computing power. 
Um, finally, it's secure at the physical level. If we're thinking of the OSI model, it's secure on the lowest layer. And as such, it can secure the complete end-to-end -end encryption without um, any need for SSL or VPN. As good as it sounds, there are some cons. It is ridiculously expensive at the moment, and this is due to it being the cutting edge of cryptography. Research and development costs are high, as are the fabrication costs of specialist components needed um, to support fragile quantum states, and this all affects the final sale price. The requirement for exacting conditions that needs to be met dictates the need for special infrastructure capable of supporting quantum cryptography, which also has its own associated cost. Finally, there are practical problems in the implementation. This is a very new technology, and there are still these practical problems to overcome. For example, fiber-based quantum key distribution can only travel so far, although, as we'll touch on later, there have been some breakthroughs in this area. So where are we with quantum cryptography right now, 2019? Well, we have true random number generators, which are essential for the secure, um, in, for its secure encryption keys and for the in, enhancement of entropy. And as we described earlier, entro entropy can be said to be a measure of disorder, randomness, or uncertainty in a system. And so the introduction of truly random number generators are of obvious benefit. And in fact, Shannon, who was the person who made that seminal 1948 paper conveying the concept of entropy, had a great anecdote about coming up with the term entropy. He said, my greatest concern was what to call it. I thought of calling it information, but that word was overly used. So I decided to call it uncertainty. When I discussed this with John von Neumann, he had a better idea. Von Neumann told me, you should call it entropy for two reasons. In the first place, your uncertainty function has been used in statistical mechanics under that name already, so it has a name. And in the second place, and more importantly, no one really knows what entropy really is, and so in a debate, you'll always have the advantage. <laughs> we also have, right now, um, quantum key distribution devices, and these allow for the secure key, uh, key exchange for encryption of a multitude of devices and a multitude of applications. Um, they're being sold by a bunch of different companies. I didn't want to use multitude three times. Um, ID Quantica's Cerberus 3 system, Magic Technologies QPN system, and Quintessence Labs QProtect are some examples. Sales so far are generally led by uh, the financial market, and following that, we have government and defense. In fact, last year, the financial segment had a market share of around 38%, so that's a pretty huge share. And this was followed quite closely behind by government and defense, which accounted for about 31% and 27% of the market, respectively. So that, that's almost the whole market. Uh, plans for new quantum key distribution networks exist in the US with Battelle, Japan with NICT, and China with Quantum CTEC. So we are seeing big governments across the world starting to adopt this technology. And in fact, their, est their market is estimated to grow to 4.8 billion by 2023, coming from 1.7 billion last year. Cool. So we touched on it, but what exactly is quantum key distribution? It is certainly the best known and most well-developed branch of quantum cryptography. It has the goal of providing an information theoretically secure solution to the problems of key exchange. Utilizing QKD protocols, I'm going to say quantum key distribution a lot, so I've abbreviated it to QKD for the sake of my voice in your ears. Um, utilizing QKD protocols, two parties should be able to establish a key that can be used for secure communications without that key being unknowingly intercepted by a third party. This should remain the case even if all communications were done over public channels. They still should not be able to be an unknown eavesdropper who is able to enumerate the key. Whilst unconditional security has been proven mathematically, that is to say there are no constraints placed on the abilities of the eavesdropper, and this is not something possible with classical key distribution, there are some assumptions that need to be made. One being that the universe hasn't had a change of heart and the laws of quantum mechanics still hold to be true, and the other being that two genuine parties, so Alice and Bob, our A and B, can successfully authenticate each other. So Eve can't impersonate either and thus conduct man in the middle attacks. Whilst it's seemingly secure, there are still issues in its implementation with 
key generation rate being a particular issue. Um, we can't generate keys as quick as we can with classical systems, not at the moment at least, and transmission data distance still being an issue. When I first talked about transmission distance, I had someone tell me, what, you mean it can't go further than a few nanometers? That's not exactly what I mean. It, it can definitely go further than a few nanometers. Um, and in fact, we've had some breakthroughs in this area. In 2018, last year, Luca Marini et al. put forward a way to possibly overcome the rate distance limit entirely. Um, or at least make massive strides in it. And that is the proposed twin field QKD scheme. This suggests that the optimal key rate could be achieved on 550 kilometers of standard optical fiber, already used in communications today. Now the same person then turned around and asked me, does that mean we can use it in current systems, which is a perfectly valid um, question. And no, we still have things like switches and stuff like that that would get in the way and could um, destroy delicate quantum states, but it means that materials we use today, materials that aren't particularly expensive, can be employed in creating uh, QKD systems. So what besides QKD is there when it comes to quantum cryptography? It's not the end all and be all. So there's been a lot of work in the field of quantum cryptography that has focused on QKD, but it's not been the only branch where this has taken place. Other areas that address issues with QKD such as the inefficiency of QKD for large networks utilizing symmetric uh, crypto systems due to the key management overheads, or other areas related to other cryptography entirely, different tasks and functions are all being actively researched. We have things like quantum fingerprinting, quantum digital signatures, and entity authentication that have all had good strides made in their respective fields. So having spoken about QKD, let's have a look at one of the most popular quantum key distribution protocols, and the basis for many commercial devices that are available today. So what is the goal? Well, the goal is to establish a key between Alice and Bob, such that an eavesdropper, we'll call her Eve, can't listen and learn it just by listening in. Once this key has been established, it can then be used to communicate securely using something like the one-time pad algorithm. The basic idea is that Alice and Bob use quantum systems to establish the key, and if Eve tries to learn the state of the system, she'll inevitably disturb that state, and this can be detected by both Alice and Bob. Eve can sabotage the protocol, sure, in which case Alice and Bob won't be able to establish the key. However, the goal is to make sure that if Alice and Bob agree that the protocol was successful, the chance that Eve knows the key is very, very small. Oh yeah, also BB84 is a key distribution system proposed by Bennett and Brassard in 1984 and nothing to do with Star Wars. I have had that comment before. Um, so what are the steps? Alice prepares a qubit randomly in one of four states and sends it to Bob. Bob measures the received qubit in one of two bases, randomly with a probability of half or 50-50 for each one of those two bases. Alice and Bob then reveal the basis in which the qubit was both prepared by Alice and measured by Bob. They do this via a classical channel, but they do not say the state or respective outcome of their measurements and encoding. If the basis coincide, they add the bit to their list. Otherwise, they disregard that qubit entirely. In order to make sure Eve hasn't tampered, they prick a proportion of their key bits, say half, and compare them using a classical channel. They should see no significant differences. If they see differences that are much higher than the error rate of the channel, they know Eve's been meddling. So is it secure? <laughs> there are several mathematical proofs attesting to the security of this protocol. One such proof is provided in the further reading slide for anyone interested. However, the maths can be a little hairy, and more so as we go from less simple proofs. So today we'll just focus on the intuition behind the proof. The central principle is that in order for Eve to learn the key, the qubits that are sent by Alice must be intercepted and measured. If Eve knows the basis to which the qubits were prepared, happy days. She can measure it in the correct basis, learn the state without altering it, and pass it on to Bob. It, she's not cheating. It's not an unknown quantum state. She knows the state it was prepared to. She can measure it, play with it. Well, not play with it because then it would change, but measure it and then pass it on undisturbed. However, the problem is Eve doesn't know which state Alice used. And so this leaves her with two possible alternatives. Eve can choose one of the two bases randomly. She's got a 50-50 shot, measuring that basis and then pass the system on to Bob. 
If Eve, choose, if Eve chooses the same basis as that of Alice has prepared today, then she obtains the results she's looking for, happy days again, and can pass on the state to Bob, totally undisturbed. Bob will never know. On the other hand, if Eve measures in the other basis, then the state sent to Bob will have altered completely. And when Bob makes his own measurements, there is a one in four chance that he'll obtain Alice's prepared state. Those aren't great odds, so what else can she do? Well, Eve can keep the system sent by Alice and measure it only after classical communication has taken place. Once she knows, Alice says, I prepared it in this state. Bob says, I've measured it in this state. She's like, cool, I'll measure it in the state Alice prepared it in. She can um, decode the whole key. But she has to send something to Bob. And um, since she's keeping Alice's uh, qubits, and they're in an unknown state, so she can't clone them, no cloning theorem prohibits that. Hello? Right, so for my T, I'll be really well Sorry. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, so she has to send something to Bob. She can send either Alice's state along, in which case she won't have it because there is no cloning theorem, or she can make up some data and send it to Bob. So that's what she does. She makes up a bunch of bogus data and sends it on to Bob. Now there's a significant chance that Bob's measurements will give a different result to those that would have been made if he had got Alice's original signal because there's a very low likelihood that Bob, that Eve's made up data somehow perfectly resembles Alice's original data. <laughs> so using the first option, there's a small likelihood of successful eavesdropping, which further diminishes as we use a greater number of qubits. And with the second option, there's no real chance <laughs> due to the no cloning theorem, meaning um, Eve is essentially making up data and hoping it magically matches with Alice's. So, in general, Eve may employ more sophisticated attacks in which several su successive qubits are measured. This makes the proof of the security more hairy and the maths more ugly, but at the heart of the proof is the fact that quantum information cannot be copied, as dictated by the no-cloning theorem. Quantum cryptography is fast approaching the stage of technological applications, with several companies in the process of producing cryptographic systems based on the SPB84 protocol, as we've mentioned. Commercial QKD system, systems that already exist include the ID Quantico Cerberus 3 system we talked about and can be bought for the low, low price of $82,000. Now, that was when I first checked this out, and that price may have dropped by, um, since then. It could be as low as $50,000 now. Who knows? <laughs> You'd need to. You'd need them to talk to each other. <laughs> Uh, generally, in commercial systems, the four states of the qubits are implemented as four polarizations of a single photon state. Companies manufacturing such systems include Toshiba, ID Quantica, SecureNet, Quintessence Labs, and Magic Technologies. Great. So, we know about the BB84 protocol. Let's get to the fun stuff. Let's break it. So, what I want you to take away from this talk is a paradigm on how to approach pen testing quantum systems. It's not as scary as it sounds. Vulnerabilities can be broken down into two broad classes. We have inherent flaws and implementation flaws. Inherent flaws exist where an assumption made during the creation of a protocol doesn't hold to be true. A new mathematical technique or approach, for instance, may break the security of that protocol. An example of a protocol with inherent flaws would be SSL version 3. Implementation flaws, on the other hand, exist because real-world physical systems aren't perfect, nor is our, ad ad that's a hard word to say, our adaptation of, um, the, it doesn't sound like it's a hard word to say, it is when you start, stood up here, um, our adaptation of theoretical principles to physical mediums. Such imperfections can be exploited to compromise an otherwise secure protocol, as we are about to see. So, to begin with, let's remove a bit of abstraction from the BB84 protocol and think about Alice and Bob's setup. Alice needs a process for encoding her qubits, some sort of photon generator, a laser, and Bob needs an observation machine to carry out measurements, some sort of photon detector. Eve can exploit hardware weaknesses in these components to compromise the BB84 protocol. We start with one that is called the indirect copying attack. And this actually plays with one of the assumptions we made earlier, which is that Alice and Bob need to be able to successfully authenticate each other. So in this, Eve constructs a list of all of Alice's possible states she can use to encode her qubits. 
Eve then intercepts Alice's qubits as they're transmitted to Bob. She measures them and finds each qubit's value. Having found this information, she's messed around with those qubits. They're no longer in the original state. She gets rid of them. She then sends qubits to Bob, matching Alice's original signal that she creates herself. Now, that might sound like cheating, but it isn't. These are no longer unknown quantum states. And through her measurements, she's created qubits. And through clever mathematical operations, she can reverse engineer with a high probability of success Alice's original signal. So once she reproduces Alice's original signal, she sends it on to Bob. Bob's never the wiser. It's important to note that this attack only works on protocols like BB84, where the quantum state is encoded in transit. Alongside this, Eve must know all of the possible states Alice can use to encode her qubits, and try to keep her time interval between successive qubits as close as possible to Alice's original signal. Alongside keeping the delay between Alice sending and Bob receiving as small as possible, so that her presence isn't felt. Cool, that's not an easy ask, so let's look at another attack. This one is called the photon number splitting attack, and this does deal with um, component weaknesses in physical systems. So practically, with, um, with most QKD devices, I don't know if it's true of all QKD devices, but for most, single photon sources aren't used, and that's because they're incredibly difficult to manufacture. As such, Weak coherent pulses are used in most actual uh, cryptographic devices. A weak coherent pulse is a photon pulse that has a low mean photon number. And that is to say a low number of photons in that pulse on average. I do think almost all, I do think all we use weak coherent pulses. I just scared to stick my neck out and say that. Um, it can be achieved by passing short, low powered laser pulses through an attenuator. The PNS attack takes advantage of a limitation present in weak coherent pulse generators. And that's that sometimes multiple photon pulses are emitted. So what happens when a multiple photon pulse is emitted? Well, Eve can intercept a portion of those photons and send the rest on to Bob. Eve waits for Alice and Bob to announce their respective transmission and detection bases via their classical channel. And then she measures her captured photons, just like Bob would, and builds her key alongside them both. The PNS attack, whilst powerful, is complex to implement. And this is because the probability that a multiple photon pulse is emitted for a good weak coherent pulse generator is only around 5%. As such, Eve has to check whether the emitted pulse contains multiple photons or not. And this demands both proper hardware and algorithms. Given that this is all in place, however, it'd be very hard for Bob to detect Eve's presence. Finally, we come to my favorite of the attacks, and it is called the light injection attack arguably the most science fiction-y sounding of the three, but photon number splitting does give it a run for its money. Um, Eve can execute this attack against Alice or Bob. So let's take the case of Alice to begin with, and then we'll work our way back to attacking Bob. Eve sends a light pulse at one of the devices, in this case, Alice's photon generator, and registers the reflected pulse that comes back. Because of the design of QKD hardware, the reflected pulse will indicate which process or photon generator will be used by Alice to generate the next qubit. Eve knows which process Alice is about to use to encode her qubits, and thus she can perform an intercept and replay attack with 100% certainty that she'll be using the correct observer for each incoming qubit. Eve can capture the entire key as Alice sends it and send qubits to Bob without Alice or Bob being able to detect her presence. Using the information again communicated over the classical channel, Eve will be able to create the same key as Alice and Bob. Now, if she's attacking Bob, it's a very similar process. She sends a light pulse at Bob's device, enumerates in the reflected pulse which detection basis he's going to be using. She matches the same detection basis. So when Bob's right, she's right. The qubit's unchanged, gets passed on to Bob. Happy days. When she's wrong, Bob's wrong as well, which means it doesn't matter that she was wrong because Alice is just going to tell Bob, get rid of that qubit anyway. You measured it wrong. So in either case, she gets to build up the key alongside Bob and neither Alice or Bob have any clue that she was there. So those are all problematic. What can we do about them? How could we offer clients remediation advice? Well, remediation advice comes in two flavors or a combination of both of them. I wanted to use a Neapolitan joke, but it's only two flavors. Um, passive measures include inherent properties of the infrastructure that make them resistant to such attacks. An example of a passive measure for Alice would be an attenuator at the output of her setup. 
it requires more powerful lasers to get through the attenuator. Well, then we add in an optical isolator and a bandpass filter. The optical isolator will allow qubits through Alice's light through um, with no problem. But in the opposite direction, Eve trying to come in, it makes the power requirements incredibly high. It makes them untenable with the inclusion of the bandpass filter and the attenuator. Um, to do this, though, this a small note, we do need to change from single photon states that we were using theoretically to the weak coherent pulses that don't make much of a difference because they're actually what's generally used in QKD devices. We also have active measures, and an active measure is the introduction of tools designed to mitigate specific attacks. So we could say have a detector to warn Alice and Bob should average and or peak power of an incoming pulse rise above a certain level. If, they, if that happens, they know Eve is trying to send a light pulse powerful enough that the reflected pulse contains information about their encoding and detection bases. This alerts them to the fact someone is trying to enumerate their key. They can either then scrap the protocol and start again, or they can, can try and convince themselves whatever they were trying to say really isn't that important and just leave it. So, we've talked about quantum cryptography, and now we'll talk about what's considered quantum resistant or post-quantum cryptography. I don't like the term post-quantum cryptography because it implies we've already got quantum and now we're moving on to post-quantum and we haven't even got quantum yet. It's a problem most people worry about yesterday. Um, post-quantum cryptography leverages cryptographic algorithms which can be run on classical or modern like computers we have in front of us. And these algorithms are thought to be secure against quantum computer attacks. As we've stated, the problem with most algorithms that we use today is that their security is based upon a class of mathematically difficult problems all of which can be solved in a sufficiently powerful quantum computer. Even though current, publicly known quantum computers lack the processing power to be cryptographically relevant, many cryptographers are designing new algorithms for when quantum um, computers become powerful enough to be a threat. There are currently four main flavors of public key post-quantum crypto systems. The first, sorry, I just got a piece of water, because this is a mouthful is lattice-based crypto systems. Oh, it wasn't that bad, actually. I thought that'd be harder to get through. Um, this is the most well-understood and widely studied family of hard math problems. And that's being researched for post-quantum cryptography. It is perhaps the most popular flavor due to the historic mathematical interest and the versatility of the crypto schemes possible, allowing for the replacement of essentially all endangered protocols, but also the introduction of entirely new classes of cryptographic tools that are not currently available when using factoring or other hard mathematical problems. The second is code-based crypto systems. It's another popular flavor that includes crypto systems which rely on error-correcting codes, such as the Michaelis algorithm. The original Michaelis signature used random Gopper codes, which has withstood scrutiny for over 30 years. However, many variants which aim to structure the code more so as to reduce key sizes um, have been shown to be insecure, unfortunately. So we've also got hash-based public key crypto systems. And hash-based digital signatures were invented in the late 70s. They fell out of vogue as there is a limit to the number of signatures that can be signed using a corresponding set of private keys. Post-quantum cryptography has revitalized interest in this field, however. And finally, we have multivariate crypto systems. This includes encryption schemes based on the difficulty of solving systems of multivariate equations. Whilst attempts to build secure multivariate, multivariate equation encryption protocols have failed, such schemes could provide a basis for the construction of a quantum secure signature at some point. I also wanted to quickly touch upon symmetric key encryption, as given that suitably large keys are used, systems like AES are already quantum resistant. In addition to this, key management protocols which employ symmetric keys, like Kerberos, are inherently secure against attack by a quantum computer. Some researchers suggest expanding the use of Kerberos-like key management system as a way to get post-quantum cryptography today. And with Kerberos roasting, I as a pen tester can only encourage this kind of thinking. So, post-quantum cryptography, what are the pros and cons? Well, an obvious pro is the cost. Due to the decreased research and development expenses relative to quantum cryptography, in addition to it being less resource intensive, the cost of post-quantum cryptography
is significantly less. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. So. Got it. Cool. Can you hear me? Does this work? Yeah? Okay, cool. So as I was saying, it's a lot cheaper due to the decreased research and development expenses relative to quantum cryptography, in addition to it being less resource intensive. The cost of post-quantum cryptography is significantly lower than its quantum counterpart. It also works on current infrastructure, which is great. It works um, this way and it feeds into the lower costs as expensive and specialized equipment is not required in order to faci facilitate post-quantum cryptography. This form of cryptography should be capable of running on current classical computers and as such may have a larger scope of possible applications. Due in no small part to the prior two reasons, this field is massively popular, with tons of active research taking place and many supporters, including the NCSC. However, it does have several issues. Due to this being such a young field, essentially born as a response to the increasing threat quantum computers continue to place on current cryptography, there may be many flaws and inherent weaknesses that are yet to be uncovered simply due to the field's immaturity. Any such issue, when discovered, would immediately threaten the confidentiality of data secured using the relevant encryption. A particular challenge of post-quantum cryptography is the implementation of quantum-safe algorithms into existing systems. I'm sure many of us have come across clients who are forced to run outdated and vulnerable cryptography due to legacy systems which don't support modern TLS implementations. This issue will only be made worse by the introduction of post-quantum cryptography unless these implementation issues are overcome. Finally, we have key size. There are often trade-offs related to key size, computational efficiency, and ciphertext or signature size. As, care, as such, care must be taken when choosing which post-quantum cryptography algorithms to employ. Weighing, for example, the effort required to send large public keys over the internet. So, this is all interesting, but why are we talking about it now? What's the point of having this conversation today? Well, no one is sure when cryptographically relevant quantum computers will be available. Depending on how, who you ask even, estimates range from a few years to never. But the general consensus is that we should plan for around a decade. As such, a worst case scenario can be put forward of the complete failure of a massive proportion of cryptographic systems within 10 years. We should put in place a strategy early enough that will allow for quantum resilience in time to protect sensitive data for the full term of its security life. The strategies we put in place need testing and assurance so that in an attempt to address vulnerabilities, we don't end up introducing more. For some data, it can be argued that it's already too late. With harvesting attacks, we could already have people intercepting, malicious actors intercepting data today for decryption when quantum computers mature. So you want to be in the front runners, you want to be offering that assurance and testing for new quantum systems. And you've decided this all sounds great and you want to build your own quantum lab. How do you go about this? It might not be as scary as it seems. There are two ways. You can build a physical system to test particular protocols and implementations, or use virtualization. With a physical apparatus, you'd be forgiven for thinking building one would require exorbitant sums of money. Essentially, all you need to, say, model the BB-84 protocol would be a source, some kind of laser, a photon detector, some polarization filters, and beam splitters. Oh, and then some electronics as well to control all the components and, and, and register output. There are kits available which contain all the necessary components to create an analogous setup for QKD protocols. And they, I've seen some go for around two and a half thousand pounds, which uh, relatively compared to like an actual full blown quantum lab is ridiculously cheap. However, we can go cheaper. With virtualization, we can model the protocols and components. We can leverage the quantum cloud, for example, which allows for the exploration of quantum applications via systems and simulators to model and test QKD protocols utilizing real-world quantum systems 
However, this was pointed out to me, so I should stress, please don't hack the actual cloud platform. Please use it to model the protocols and hack the quantum cryptography side of it. Leave IBM alone, unless they've asked you to test them or they've got a public bug bounty. We can also use software such as MATLAB or Visual Basic to model all of our components and code the logic of these protocols and create an inexpensive virtual lab that way. There is quite a lot of material available to help in such endeavors. And there are actually um, several academic research papers that have used this virtualization approach and published in peer-reviewed journals. My personal recommendation would be to start with a virtual lab and once you've identified, oh, it's still not once you've identified um, potential vulnerabilities, then build an analogous physical model to determine how best to exploit the issues identified and also whether they constitute legitimate vulnerabilities, and if so, under what conditions. So in conclusion, there is no better physical medium for storing and processing information than quantum systems, according to quantum information theory. Quantum cryptography can be secured on the physical level, and there are many pros, but also several cons and physical hurdles yet to overcome. Commercial systems relying on quantum principles are already beginning to emerge, as we've seen, and can be tested, as we've also seen. And while several protocols are secure in theory, there exists many pen testing applications in the physical implementations of such systems. The landscape of cryptography is changing under our feet, and it's up to us to adapt to it. With the introduction of new protocols, some completely secure in theory, there still exists many pen testing applications in the physical implementations of such systems. If you can't find an inherent flaw, look for an implementation flaw. What components were used in the construction of the system? What were their technical limitations? How can these limitations be abused and protected against? Technical details for many components are publicly available, and so research into the compromise of these devices can be done without ever having to need one in front of you. <coughs> so here are some various um, further reading slides. These were all really useful in the construction of this talk and um, also provide more detail in specific areas than I've been able to go through in just an hour. Um, here are the obligatory image references, just so no one shouts at me. And I'd also like to thank Cybris for allowing me the time and resources to put this presentation together. They've been brilliant. Uh, particularly, I'd like to thank also Mark Crowther, Catherine Ferry, and Ian Lonsborough for their guidance and encouragement. Besides Manchester for providing such a stellar platform. And you all for listening patiently. Thank you very much. I think we should try and get this mic up and running if, if we can. Has anyone got any questions for Imran? Wow, okay. Scott. <laughs> the most gorgeous man in InfoSec. <laughs> <laughs> I can't ask a good question after that. Uh, you mentioned that AES is currently considered to be quantum resistant. Is that with 128-bit symmetric or do we have to go higher? So it's to do with, I don't know the intricacies of it, but I know it's, it's, it's quantum resistant in the same way a mathematical tool that quantum quantum computers won't have any extra power in cracking. It's not, yeah, it's not using, say, prime number factorization where quantum computers have obvious benefit. And so if it's secure against a classical system, AES, it should also be secure against a quantum system as it shouldn't be able to crack it much faster. No. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank With every much. quantum computer, it tends to be a, a logarithm, not, not a logarithmic improvement in integer factorization size. It seems to be jumps. Um, and last time I checked, it, the largest number a quantum computer could factorize was 14. Um, do you know what the, the sort of numbers they can factorize now is? So I don't know exactly what we've gotten up to. It changes quite quickly, but I do know from estimates, estimates and guesses. Oh, should I speak into that? Um, for estimates and guesses, that we would need around 4,000 qubits with a good architecture and, and good noise reduction and error code corrections um, to get to crack something like RSA 2048. Um, so we're still a way off, but uh, it's, we, we have, in quantum computers, we have like 
a version of Moore's law happening. So it, it shouldn't take, as scary as 4,000 cubic sounds and as massive as it sounds, it shouldn't take a great amount of time to get there. Yes. Any more questions? No? Okay. With, oh, here we go. It's a bit more of a simple one, but <clears throat> what really will the end product be like for just the general public more than the private sectors and all that? So it, de it really depends on where and how far breakthroughs happen within quantum cryptography. So far with QKD and stuff, you're very much right in saying it's a lot of private sector stuff and we're not going to really see a lot of that happening for us. It's, it's really whether we can get some of the smaller fields, um, say entity authentication and stuff like that. How, how, mu how, many, how much room we can give it to grow and how much funding we give it and kind of the legs on it. It's, it's really quite early to be able to kind of uh, predict on, on the public system side. But what I would say is even if we don't get there very soon with quantum cryptography, it's very promising with post-quantum cryptography that we'll get things um, like securing your home computer on the internet, um, going from TLS to some post-quantum cryptography solution. Cheers. Any more questions for Imran? No? Okay. Um, thanks again, Imran. Thank you very much.